Dr. Kari Olson received his PhD from the University of Southern California in 2015. He received his BS and his Master's of Accountancy degrees from BYU in 2009. And his research interests are in management control systems and personality characteristics. His research has been published in the Journal for Management Accounting Research, the Journal of American Taxation Association, and Issues in Accounting Education. He and his wife, Lexi, have two children, a boy and a girl. I'll turn the time over to him. So, can you hear me? First things first, we need more chairs. We'll grab some chairs. I'm not going to use so you can grab those, or there's a whole stack right there. I'm actually going to move this so I can dance around up here. Okay, well, thank you for coming today. Uh, I just want to throw out a few uh, disclaimers, a few things just to get up front uh, about this presentation. First one is that if you have any questions about things on my slides, I have citations for journal articles for all of these, but I've, I've suppressed those, uh, so it's a little bit easier for you visually. Um, but they're all there, and I have uh, the references if you'd like them. Uh, the second thing that's important, I'm going to give you some recommendations based off theory, based off some uh, research studies. It's important to remember these are on average effects. Okay? That's all we can ever conclude from our, these studies. And so when you take anything back, if you tried to implement it, you'd say, well, it didn't work. Well, it's an average effect. If you did it 100 times, it would probably be on average work. So uh, every individual is different. These are personality traits. Uh, people have a whole array of personality traits. I'm going to talk about two of them. So of this array, there could be some uh, other traits that might be more prominent. So uh, I just want to throw that disclaimer out. So if I give you recommendations that doesn't work, you don't blame me. And the last one is a few of the techniques I'm going to tell you, you're going to say, I already knew that. That's obvious. Um, what you should take away from it then is that it's really important. That in general, it does matter to people. But for these individuals I'm going to tell you about, it really matters a lot. So uh, with those three things, let me tell you what we're going to do today. First, uh, my first goal for the first 15, maybe even 20 minutes, I want to really outline for you what these two personality traits are of narcissism and psychological entitlement. Now, you may have some prior experience with this. You may have read stuff in the newspapers, business press, about these traits. But I really want to get a little bit of academic book work to really understand what these are, how they affect how people behave. Then I'm going to talk about why this matters to an education setting. Most of my research on this stuff is in the business setting, in management settings, understanding uh, how employees behave, how CEOs behave. But it does apply to the education setting, so I want to tell you why I think it matters. And finally, I want to give you some practical things that you can do in your classroom um, that I think will help uh, have a positive experience in dealing with people who have these personality traits. So the first step is, what is narcissism? Does anyone have an idea, a one-sentence definition of narcissism? Self-centered? Anything else? They think they're awesome. <laughs> okay. So this is one of the most interesting things, right? They think they're awesome. I'm going to challenge that. Okay. It's not, right? That's the outward appearance of what we see. Uh, there's actually more to it. So we're going to do a little Greek mythology back to Narcissus. So Narcissus uh, has the story, right? He falls in love with the image of himself. And so if we go back to uh, the old story, it says this. It says, all that is lovely in himself he loves, and in his witless way he wants himself. And then we find out he knows not what he there beholds, but what he sees inflames his longing, and the error that deceives alerts his eyes. So there's an important point right here, is we think of narcissism as this self-love, right? He fell in love with the image of himself, uh, and they think they're so great. The problem is, with narcissism, is he doesn't recognize himself. It's not that he loves himself, it's that he doesn't see who that's him in the image. And so it's actually there's this self-loathing, this disconnect with who they are, and I'll talk about the causes of narcissism, 
And so they have struggled with this self-identity. And to make up for that, they engage in this gregarious, charismatic behavior that, oh, they love themselves. Uh, that one is actually egotism. An egotist has a high self-esteem and thinks really high of himself. A narcissist actually has a really fragile uh, self-esteem, a self-loathing, but the manifestations are similar. Um, so when you think of narcissists in the future, don't think of falling in love with himself. It's that he can't recognize himself. So the APA has a formal definition of narcissism as a pervasive and enduring pattern of grandiose behavior in fantasy or actual behavior, the need for affirmation, and a lack of empathy. The lack of empathy is one of the most common things when you think of a narcissist, is they have a struggle connecting with other people's emotions because they can't even connect with their own. Um, when we measure narcissism, uh, there's a distinction I need to make. First, there's clinical narcissism. You need a psychiatrist, a psychologist, to make this assessment. So what I'm talking about today is mostly subclinical. This is something that each of us has, just as any personality trait. And when we assess this, there's a 40-question uh, response scale. and has seven subcomponents. Uh, it tells you they have a sense of authority. And I want you to think, as I, as I talk about these, is this good or bad? So a sense of authority. A sense of superiority. A sense of exploitativeness. A sense of self-sufficiency. A sense of exhibitionism a sense of vanity, and a sense of entitlement. So do you think those are all good or all bad? Both? Which one of those is good? Self-sufficiency? Self well, that sounds pretty good, right? But what if I'm in a team setting? Mm, maybe not, right? So what was that? Leadership. So my research mostly is on narcissism and CEOs. And it's been shown <laughs> MBA students are more narcissistic than the average college student. And that kind of is a proxy for leadership, right? Uh, they can ascend the corporate ladder. For some of these reasons, a sense of authority is important if you're a CEO or if you're a business leader or a leader of any kind. Uh, you may have deans or university presidents. Uh, not that we have that here, just, I mean, any leader you think of may have these traits, and they may actually be a really good thing that helps propel them, be a leader, be charismatic, and uh, inspire the people that are following them. Now, I have a harder time thinking of a sense of vanity, a sense of exploitativeness. Those things are a little more malignant, right? There's not a lot of good things about those. So if you use this 40-question scale, you'd get seven subscales, and you'd see that someone can be high in narcissism, but it may not be this destructive, maladaptive form. It may be constructive. So some of the things you'd see in their behavior, you'd see that they want self-enhancement. They want opportunities to reaffirm their sense of superiority, to reaffirm their vanity. So they're going to actively seek for these opportunities. Uh, they're also going to seek for attention. Uh, if you think in the most... Uh, Malignant forms, where you have actually a personality disorder, you'd think of some Hollywood examples. So I did my PhD at USC, so you'd see all the news in LA. Uh, people like Paris Hilton, Charlie Sheen. Uh, very disturbing behaviors, and it's probably because of, uh, of narcissism. Um, one of the things they don't do, which is difficult, we'll get to in an education setting, is they don't handle criticism well. Uh, they actually don't process it. If you sit down and talk to them, you give them positive feedback, negative feedback, and then they do a debriefing session, they'll just say the positive. They don't even process in their minds this negative feedback. So that's a problem. And it has been linked with some low integrity, deviant behavior. So CEOs that are narcissistic are, have lower quality of financial reporting. They're more likely to commit fraud. And they're more likely to evade taxes. So those are kind of bad things. Uh, my research also found that they are more likely to have higher earnings and higher stock price. So there's that balance again. Um, so one of the frameworks that you could take to understand narcissism is first uh, this high approach, high avoidance. 
This has to do with the risk taking. So a narcissist really wants these good things. Uh, they'll take risks in order to get the attention, the acclaim, and affirmation from others. And they'll run from the bad things. Uh, so you see this, uh, I guess in my research you'd see this, the CEOs have shorter tenures if they're narcissistic. Uh, running to the next good thing, trying to avoid bad things. They have this inflated and entitled view of themselves that require constant feedback. Uh, this is where that disconnect, a narcissist did not recognize himself. Because he didn't recognize himself, he has this struggling in developing a self-image. So he constantly needs feedback because he thinks he's so great, but there's not a lot there to support it. Um, this relates to their desire for self-esteem, uh, something that was, is absent from them. They're really fragile. Now, if you had them take a self-esteem a self-esteem test, they may actually score really high. But it's this fragility where they constantly need it reinforced. And finally, they're very self-focused. Um, narcissists only care about what they think of themselves. They don't care about other people. Uh, this lack of empathy. So I got a few quotes that uh, I want to read to you about this. The first one says, think of a narcissist as individuals for whom enhancing the positivity of the self to achieve status and esteem is overwhelmingly important. Much of their psychological and social lives are directed towards this goal. The next one comes from a book from one of my uh, advisors at USC about celebrity narcissism. And here they say that narcissists are masters at creating ways of getting what they do need, and it's a need, uh, not just a want, it's a need uh, to exist. Positive feedback and stroking from others. So let me show you some of the data on this. We have a, a longitudinal study uh, using that narcissistic personality inventory over a 20-year period. And you can see back in the 1980s, it was about an average score of 15. And this has increased uh, almost at a 13% rate in 2006. And uh, some of the other things, one out of four college students. So there's something unique about college students, uh, the millennial age that they are more narcissistic. And then one out of 16 of all those of all ages. So there's something about the students you're going to encounter at college uh, that they're going to be more narcissistic. Um, some more data. So the first point just is reemphasizing this 13% increase. Um, there's another study that did the whole population, uh, 35,000 respondents, and found that 6% of the population has these high narcissism. Um, men are more narcissistic than women. And younger people are more narcissistic than older people. Um, this is a quote, um, kind of about these causes. Uh, and frankly, it's disturbing uh, why this happens. So as the disorder form, not necessarily the personality, uh, subclinical, it's caused by early childhood trauma in the form of sexual, physical, or emotional abuse, or severe neglect. Early childhood experiences threaten self-esteem and lead to feelings of shame, right? This is Narcissus not being able to recognize himself because it's a shameful experience. He disconnects. Uh, they feel emptiness and self-blame, which cause an unrelenting desire to seek attention, admiration, and external validation. So let me give you the data on those causes, which is also disturbing. And this is why you see this strong correlation between narcissism and these things. So from 1980 to 1983, the incidence of maltreatment of children per 1,000 rose from 9.8 to, to 23.1, doubling in 13 years. And then continuing to the next period, uh, emotionally neglected children more than doubled over this time period. Um, yes, I mean, there, there's... Sure, sure. Certainly part of this could just be improved reporting. Um, the increase in narcissism, and knowing this is a cause of narcissism, makes me think that it's also increasing just by itself. So I think there's probably both mechanisms. Um, so these things uh, lead to maladaptive personalities uh, in early childhood. So there's another cause. This is more, that was more the clinical psychology view. 
the social psychology view, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to put be pointing blame at a lot of people in the room. Don't feel it's personal. This is just <laughs> what happens, right? So one of them is parenting styles. Uh, we had a generation of the, old, the, the greatest generation came home from World War I, World War II, and they had children, the baby boomers. And those parents were very strict. Uh, there wasn't a lot of resources. So these baby boomers grew up and, and had this ideal that I'm going to give my children everything. They'll have what I didn't have. So you see a lot of parents that are overindulgent. Uh, they live through their children because the children have opportunities, so they become helicoptering parents. Uh, and they overpraise. You know, you know, uh, every children get, child gets a trophy is the, is the theme here. Um, there's actually an NFL player last week. There was a big story about this. He, he took the trophies away from his kids. It's their participation trophies. Um, as academics, we're partly to blame. Great inflation. And this is because we blur the lines between effort and reward. Uh, we just think they, they put a little effort in, if they show up, they should get good grades. So um, Then the final thing is social media and celebrity culture. We have technology. We can see dysfunctional behavior in the people that we care about and worship and want to be like. Well, those dysfunctionalities carry over to the children who say, she behaved that way or he behaved that way. This is how I'm going to behave. So a lot of causes of, of narcissism uh, from a social and a clinical view. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes about narcissism and just really gives you the punch of what's happening in our society. The bubble of narcissism is always at risk of bursting. That's why young people are higher on drugs than ever, drunker than ever, smoking more, tattooed more, pierced more, and having more and more and more sex earlier and earlier and earlier, raising babies before they can do it well because it makes them feel special for a while. They're doing anything to distract themselves from the fact that feeling empty inside and unworthy. Uh, so if this doesn't ring true from what you see in the media and news and trends, I just I feel like this is spot on. Uh, uh, something that's happened in our society that we need to be aware of. Okay, so I'm going to press pause on narcissism. We'll come back to it. Any questions about narcissism? You mentioned the instrument that was used in the studies. I was wondering which one. Uh, so all of them use the, the, uh, the narcissistic personality inventory. Uh, Raskin and Terry, 1988. It's really well uh, validated and constructed. <laughs> thing. It's 40 questions. Uh, yeah. Any other questions about narcissism? Keeps going. Yep. Yep. I, I don't have the data from those authors, but I do know that it uh, keeps going. Okay. So I'm going to shift to go to the next one, uh, and then we'll get some specific recommendations. So psychological entitlement. Previously, this was treated just as part of narcissism entitlement, uh, but there's been work by uh, many psychologists to differentiate this as a, in, its own individual trait. It's something different. Um, so what is it? The, the way to simply describe it is just a sense of deservingness. You feel that you deserve things. Uh, so it's not accompanied by the exploitativeness, vanity that you see with narcissism. It's just this feeling of, yeah, I deserve things, um, regardless of any objective merits. Uh, it can be thought of a process that causes individuals to perceive their world in a way that constantly promotes self-esteem, confidence, and other positive, if unrealistic, self-perceptions. When you think of the millennial generation, this one is very descriptive. Of, of those students. Um, this is an issue for a lot of companies. So these large, large companies are hiring people called praise consultants. <laughs> and they come in and they say, we need to motivate your young employees, your millennials. So maybe on Friday, if they show up for work on time, we'll give them a, like a candy bar or something. Uh, yeah, simple things, showing, I mean, basic job expectations. Um, they have all these different things like, oh, we need lots of employees of the month, we need all these you know, social things, we need to recognize our employees. Um, big companies spending mega bucks to have people tell them how to praise their employees. Um, entitlement is not a good thing. It's related to uh, many negative outcomes. Uh, unethical behavior, corruption, 
dissatisfaction with your life, if you always feel like you deserve more, well, life doesn't always give you more, so you feel this sense of unfairness, and so you're dissatisfied. Um, there was one group that took a lot of personality traits and put them in a, you know, a big statistical model and said, what's the best predictor of anger at God? Well, if you're entitled, that's the trait. Uh, the sense, you know, life's unfair. So therefore, you're angry at other people and you're angry at God. Um, so this is how the, we commonly measure entitlement. Seven questions. Give you a second to read a few of those. Number three is my favorite. <laughs> now, I kid you not, I've graded, I've coded a lot of these. People answer seven, that they agree on some of these. And you say, wow, really? People do? Yeah, they do. People get really high scores on this. Say what? Which measure? So this is uh, Campbell et al. 2004 uh, psychological entitlement scale, and there's this is I've found this to be really good. Uh, simple questions: Do you deserve more? People feel this way. Um, unfortunately, there's limited research on the specific causes of entitlement, but the the research that does exist points to the social causes I talked about earlier. Everyone deserves a trophy. No child left behind. Um, helicopter parenting creating this sense of entitlement. Um, so why does this matter to educators? Um, one of the things that matters is it affects how people interact with others, the desire for interpersonal interaction. So I want to talk about two of these. The first one is sociotropy, which is a need for affirmation and approval for others. And kind of almost the antithesis is autonomy, which is a need for independence from others. You don't want to feel controlled by others. So these are kind of pretty different. Well, entitlement is this funny, funny trait because it's positively related to both of them. I want a high sense of autonomy. I don't want to feel beholden to others, but I rely on them. I'm dependent upon their affirmation and approval. And so that's kind of an interesting dynamic. Um, and so they think of what do others think of me? Narcissism, on the other hand, is negatively related to sociotropy. They don't care what others think, right? It's all about what I think of myself. And when it comes to autonomy, they're kind of mixed because as long as it serves their purpose, it doesn't matter. Um, so this is, these are pretty distinct preferences for how I interact with people. Um, the next thing, why it matters to educators, is students are going to be like this. 40% uh, of the workforce is currently millennial. Uh, it will be 75% in the next 10 years all those students coming through your classroom into the workforce. Um, and this then affects how we design classroom instruction, how it affects performance evaluations, how it affects learning. Um, it also is related to grade inflation, which again is this, uh, I deserve a reward. And then finally, academic cheating. We're all gonna face it. I have had, had people cheat in my class, and people with these traits are, have a higher propensity to engage in these questionable activities. So we need to be aware of that uh, as we perform our uh, assessments and evaluations. So now, in the final few minutes, I want to talk about what you can do, how you can adapt classes or different teaching techniques. So the first one is feedback frequency. So people that are entitled and narcissistic have this desire to know what others think of them or get an assessment of what they can think of themselves. And so they want praise and feedback frequently. Um, but when they do this, they don't want criticism. So there's this tough balance. So some of the just really simple practical things, keeping performance up to date in your, your grading system so they can be aware, they can self-assess. Um, returning things quickly. They, take a test, they want to know very soon how well they did. So if you're waiting a few weeks, you're going to get students that are upset. Now, many students will get upset by this, but these students are more likely to be more upset, right? This is going to agitate them a lot. Um, you want to take advantage of online tools. We have great technology that can provide instant feedback uh, to these people. And then kind of the, your role is you need to facilitate this, have an open door policy, have a uh, Ability to respond quickly to emails, connect with these students, 
They're, they really want this. Um, and so if you can find a way to provide that, uh, they'll probably be happier. Next thing is negative feedback. Unfortunately, we have to give negative feedback. Uh, it's not practical to give positive all the time. And studies, at least in, in my area, in management accounting, have shown that negative feedback actually improves performance more than positive feedback. Uh, often because it's informative, it tells you that you haven't done something to a standard and you need to improve. Uh, there's an article just in the Wall Street Journal uh, just a few months ago. It was titled, Everything is Awesome, Why You Can't Tell Employees They're Doing a Bad Job. And it went through all these companies and all these ways of how to restructure your um, communications instead of saying, oh, you didn't do good on this part. You'd say, you did so well on these three things and just kind of highlight it. Um, but I don't, it's not practical. You can't give praise all the time. So I want to tell you about one of my studies. So we had students come in. Uh, they completed a simple task. And we told them just blunt feedback. You did better or worse than someone next to you. Um, and so if you look at just the people that got negative feedback, we had this feedback come from a supervisor or from a delegated uh, manager who was more a peer. Okay? So let me show you the data on this. People that were high in entitlement uh, performed really well. I think I have a laser up here. When it came from a superior. They hated when it came, uh, let's see, oh, right here. They hated when it came from a peer. And over here, low entitled people did not like it when it came from a superior and did really well when it came from a peer. Our peers are important reference groups, and entitled people feel superior to them. Uh, but they also have this need for affirmation. And so a supervisor can provide this. And so they engage in what we call impression management to give this supervisor the impression that, hey, I'm, I'm doing a good job. You can think highly of me. Where the contrast is uh, people that were not entitled actually are more comfortable with their peers. So what does this mean? Um, I think one of the practical things here is professors versus TAs is a really good map from supervisor to uh, a delegate. If you're providing negative feedback to an entitled person, it might be better to come from the professor than a TA. Um, and I don't know all the intricacies of your class, but that is an interesting uh, implication of our research. Um, and the next thing is that group work might be difficult, uh, especially when it's evaluative, if they have to make evaluations of others. So I'm hoping you can kind of think through that in your own situation, but it might be irritating if you have entitled people, you put them in group work. Um, a lot of this is because uh, they're sensitive to how others think of them and they feel the sense of superiority. So um, the next thing is this is kind of the individual versus team, kind of the same theme. Uh, for narcissists, they don't like teamwork, right? They want, they're self-sufficient. So if you put them in a setting where they have teamwork and the rewards are dispersed based off teamwork, it's going to frustrate them. Uh, now, they do need to learn this. The world works this way. So maybe you do want to keep it in your class, but you need to be aware of the implications that you might have more irritated students, you might have more complaints um, in those settings. Um, the next thing is uh, public versus private. So this is getting to the uh, van sense of vanity, um, sex of, sense of exhibitionism. So narcissists really like social rewards. They really like other people to think highly of them. It, uh, so it allows them to think highly of themselves. So where, does it, where do we see this happening? I've seen this when people are picking their careers, where they'll feel comfortable. People go work for companies that are cool. This is the big thing in California, uh, going to work for Facebook. Uh, this is awesome, or Google, right? You get all these cool social rewards, and when you go to their campuses, those companies, you can get your laundry done, you can get free food to take home to your family, all these different rewards that aren't necessarily monetary, uh, that kind of gives people status. Um, you can also think of the narcissists as high achievers. So they're going to want to go for scholarships and fellowships and internships. They're going to be want to, you know, be out in front. They're movers and shakers. So, like I said, narcissistic CEOs actually do some good things. Uh, 
So some of your students may display this. You may want to direct them to, hey, you could be a leader. You may want to be aware of your downfalls. Uh, but that's where I see it applying. Um, the next one is goal setting. And this is uh, tied to their sense of need for achievement. Narcissists will set really high goals, and they'll achieve them. And so as an educator, you need to challenge your students. Uh, you set the bar, and they'll rise to it because um, they really want to do well. And for the entitled people, they have this high sociotropy, the sense of affirmations. So they're going to engage in impression management. So if, if you have a high standard, they're going to they're try to meet it. Um, but I think there's some important things with grade inflation on this. So please do not confuse the level of effort with the quality of work. Uh, and you've got to make that clear to these students because their expectations of what they're going to receive is so important. Um, so challenging them can actually deflate the reward expectations and remove this sense of, oh, life's unfair. I didn't get what I deserved. Um, and that's related to my last point here is the managing expectations. Um, you can establish clear guidelines for assignments. Uh, clear, you should be doing this stuff anyway, but clear due dates uh, clear task requirements. What this does is you establish an expectation in their minds of what I need to do. And if it's not clear, they're going to get upset. Um, if you change it, they probably not, may not understand it. They're again going to get upset. So it really puts a big burden on educators to be very clear about what we're doing, what you expect, and how the rewards are given. Um, so, you know, providing clear rate, grading rubrics and uh, be clear up front about what you're going to grade on. Um, so I'll turn it. Is there any questions in the last few minutes? Do narcissists tend to be more um, racist, sexist, and homophobic? You know, I don't know. I bet there's research on that. I don't know. She was wondering if, they, if narcissists are more racist, sexist, sexist homophobic. homophobic. Uh, I don't know. There could be. I'm sure there's research on that. Right. That's why this last point is so important. You've got to be super clear up front what the expectations are, how they accomplish it, what the grade's going to be given on, because that removes the sense of uh, subjectivity or opinion and allows them to say, well, you know, this is what I need to do. So you, you have to be very clear on expectations. Otherwise, they make assumptions that they deserve stuff. I'm not saying it's your problem. I'm just saying so I wonder, you could get. I wonder why the how is that? Well, so part of it is our goal is to educate, right? We're trying to educate them and provide the environment. And so what I'm telling you, here are some personalities and certain behavioral tendencies that can affect the way you structure classroom or affect the way you deal with students. Uh, complaints, irritations. Uh, so part of it's just going to be where you're going to be in this environment where you're going to face students that have these traits. I think about the generations too, because I'm that baby who doesn't understand their thinking process, and so I have to kind of do what. Yes, that's, that's why I spent so much time at the beginning. It's just awareness is the first step. You got to you got to be aware of what these are. And then, you know, there's a lot of resources of how to deal with it. Any other questions? I had one question on your last, last slide, but not this one. Um, talking of leaving the clinical side kind of as a separate category, talking about the subclinical folks, um, let's say we're in the business of shaping behavior to make successful individuals as they leave the university environment and go on to a career. 
Um, is there a chance, you think, that we might be exacerbating the problem when we immediately respond to a student's email? Because what we have then done is we reinforce the narcissistic and entitled behavior and raise that expectation that we are now on call 24-7 help desk for the student. And um, I'm sorry, but I'll ask a two-part question. And even when we have grading rubrics and expectations for the scale up uh, for the classes up front, we oftentimes get feedback from even the subclinical individuals of, why did I get a 99.5%? Right. And <laughs> when you explain why the half percent was taken off, as you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, the negative feedback isn't heard anyway. So what do you recommend doing? Uh, part of these you're just going to have to deal with, right? I mean, I think some of these things I point out are just, you know, tools to help you have a more, a better experience teaching, a uh, better way to connect with these people. But, yeah, some of them are just so entitled that they're going to fight for half a point. And maybe that goes all the way back to elementary school where they've always felt that way. I don't know all the causes, right? I mean, this is just an awareness. This is not only education, this is a society issue of, Effort, quality, rewards, right? How we're mixing those links. So I think we've got to cut off, but I'm happy to talk after. So.